I was as surprised as anyone to read this because the assumption is what we get from the media is that Christian men are exhibit A of toxic masculinity. That's right. This was the co-founder of the Church Two movement, which followed the Me Too movement. Right. And she said, um, the theology of male headship feeds the rape culture wow. that we see permeating American Christianity today. Hey fam, I'm so excited to be at Houston Christian University today, meeting with Professor Nancy Piercy, the author of The Toxic War on Masculinity. What you're about to watch is an exclusive interview. Her and I sitting down and talking about manhood, masculinity, the church, and it is phenomenal. She is spectacular. Um, she is warm and kind and brilliant, and I, I know you're gonna love Professor Piercy. You're gonna love her book, um, Better Man is a big fan. I'm a big fan, so I hope I hope you enjoy this interview, and I want you to I want you to catch the nuance. I want you to catch uh, what we're talking about: the difference between um, nominal Christian men, men who are Christian in name only, versus committed followers of Christ, and this this sacred secular script, and how how it affects and influences those two types of men. It makes a world of difference. So enjoy the interview. We'll see you soon. Professor Piercy, so excited to be with you here on the campus of Houston Christian University in this beautiful chapel. What a wonderful building this is. And it's, uh, um, I know on behalf of the Better Man family, uh, the Better Man Network, um, a lot of, of, of evangelical men and Christian men who, who tune in that are, that are wanting to be more like King Jesus. They're wanting to, to, to really walk in God's good design for their life. Um, this is going to be super beneficial for them. So thank you so much for agreeing to meet with us today. Well, thanks for having me. It really is an honor. Excellent, excellent. I love um, in your in your phenomenal book. Um, I'm a big fan. It was actually recommended uh, to me by a mentor of mine, and he said you have to read this, uh, the toxic war on masculinity. You talk about that that secular script around masculinity and manhood today. Could you, could you unpack that a little bit and, and so our hearers and our, and our viewers can, can really get a glimpse of um, what, is, what is the world saying about men today? Well, what I found interesting is this is one of my most fact-based books. And so I will start by answering with a sociological study hmm. because, um, because it revealed that men are actually trapped in a sense between two competing scripts for masculinity, and that's what we need to understand. So this is a sociologist named Michael Kimmel, and he's you know, not a Christian, but he gets invited to speak all around the world. Mm -hmm. And so he came up with a clever experiment. He said, uh, I began asking young men two questions. First, what does it mean to be a good man? Mm -hmm. If you're at a funeral and in the eulogy somebody says he was a good man, what does that mean? And the sociologist said all around the world, Young men had no trouble answering that. They would immediately start listing things like honor, duty, sacrifice, integrity, <laughs> do the right thing, look out for the little guy, <laughs> right. I like that one, <laughs> and then prote be a protector, be a provider, be responsible. And so he would ask them, where'd you learn that? Huh. And they'd say, I don't know, it's just in the air we breathe. And, or you and I would say, you know, because men are made in God's image. Right. It is universal. They do have an innate, inherent sense of what it means to be a good man. Wow. That God did not give them their unique strengths to get whatever they want, That's right. you know, but to love, to serve, to provide, to protect. And by the way, if they were in a, a country, these young men, uh, with a Christian background, then they would often say, it's part of our Judeo-Christian heritage. Oh, wow. But then he would ask the follow-up question, right? The second question was, what if I say to you, man up, be a real man? And the young men themselves would say, oh no, that's completely different. That means be, be strong, be tough, never show weakness, mm. suck it up, play through pain, mm. uh, make it at all costs, uh, be competitive, get rich, get laid, mm. using their language. That's right. <laughs> and so this sociologist concluded that all around the world, men are trapped between competing scripts. On the one hand, they do have that innate knowledge 
because they're made in God's image of what it means to be a good man. Or we might appeal to Romans 2, right, that we all have a conscience. Wow. And, and even in non-Christian cultures, That's they right. have a sense of, of manly honor, manly duty. Uh, but they are then also pressured, especially in our modern culture, to live out very different traits. Yeah. Not that all those traits are bad. I mean, being tough is a good thing in a crisis. Sure. <laughs> but if it gets decoupled from the vision of the good man, the moral, the moral standard, then it can slide into uh, entitlement, dominance, misogyny, yeah. and so on. In other words, it can become the Andrew Tate yeah. <laughs> <laughs> standard uh, of uh, fast cars, fast money, fast women. That's right. <laughs> That's and right. by the way, it, it, what's not in the book is I recently got an email from a former graduate student here at Houston Christian University. <laughs> My graduate student is now teaching at a high school. Okay. And she said, all my male students are fans of Andrew Tate. Yeah. They're even using Andrew Tate quotations in their yearbook. Yeah. I said, where do you teach? At a classical Christian school. Wow. So that, that was my response to, wow, if we are not communicating a Christian standard, a Christian vision, yes. an aspiring vision of, of Christian uh, manhood, then our young men are reaching out to these online influencers. I don't know about, they, they may not know this, but I heard uh, an interview with Andrew Tate where he said quite openly that he's a pimp. He said, yeah. Yes, I'm a pimp, and what I do is I produce pornography. That's right. And there's a new influencer who's coming up and is becoming very popular. His name is Myron Gaines, mm. and he's been heralded by the New York Post as the new Andrew Tate. Wow. His program is called uh, Fresh and Fit. And his tagline is, I help men transform from simps into pimps. Oh, wow. Wow. And he's written a book, he's even written a book, in which he says, all the relationships between men and women has always been transactional. All men are Johns, all women are whores. Wow. And his program is becoming quite popular. That's it. So this is the secular, you asked, your, your opening question is, what's the secular script? Yeah. I, I think that's the secular script that a lot of young men are picking up today. It is, and that goes back to, to one of your previous works. As a matter of fact, you and I were talking about it earlier, the total truth, uh, that when, when we don't approach things uh, with, with a biblical worldview, with, with, with a biblical framework, um, we'll allow, um, secular will allow uh, philosophical kind of worldviews to seep in and eventually those will dominate and take over right so so many young men today that that don't know how to approach their manhood they don't know how to approach their strength they don't know how to approach their masculinity and with and in a biblical framework they'll listen to andrew tate and david goggins and <laughs> and from simps to pimps i mean that that becomes their mantra these become the loudest voices in the room yeah, I like, I like the way you put it. You know, if there's, if there's a vacuum, mm. something will rush in to fill it. So if there's a vacuum in the church, yeah. uh, you know, if we don't have good men's programs mm. that are inspiring men with a biblical view of masculinity, then we shouldn't be surprised that secular views come on in. I was, um, inter I was interviewed by a young, a young Christian couple mm. for a podcast. They were newly married and they had a podcast. So I turned it around and asked them some questions. And, and I said, what do, what do you think? What's your experience in the church? Do you think even in the church, young men are picking up these secular scripts? And they said, absolutely. Hmm. They said, very much like in the dating scene, even in the church, it's assumed that men are just more naturally prone to sin and vice and lust, hmm. you know, and that, that the sexual temptation is just roiling under the surface wow. and you're ready to break through at any moment. Uh, that is, and that it's up to the woman to make sure you know, that she keeps her boundaries, that she's the one who's in charge, you know, that she's, she's tasked you know, with being sort of the spiritual leader almost. But the, the, this the young couple told me that in the Christian church there is a double standard hmm. where in a sense men are given, um, you know, they're sort of let off the hook wow. because you know, oh, well, it's just the masculine nature. Yeah. And, and, then, and women are in a sense tasked with being the moral guardians of the home. Hmm which by the way, goes all the way back to the 19th century. But if, these, if this uh, young couple is any indication, it's still very much part of the church. Absolutely, and that's, that, that's interesting. It's one of, the, one of my favorite parts about your book is the historical perspective, because the vacuum didn't happen overnight. 
And, and it goes back to, like you said, the 19th century, the 18th century. You talked about the Industrial Revolution, things of that nature. So, so kind of, if you would, paint for us a picture of what has happened historically with these scripts and with manhood. Yeah, let me lead into it by saying that I have discovered a lot of people don't really understand that my, my book is a book of apologetics. Mm. <laughs> you know, everything I write is apologetics. It's all about how do we discern what's wrong with the secular world. Wow. You know, because people are, people are trying to drag it into, you know, in-house debates over egalitarian and complementarian. And, and actually, I don't deal with that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, parenthetically, and I also explain why I don't deal with it. <laughs> Because two of the top marriage researchers who I, you know, who, who I researched say it doesn't seem to make much difference. Hmm. Um, Brad Wilcox is a sociologist at the University of Virginia, considered one of the top marriage researchers in the country. And he said, we just don't find much difference you know, if a man has an egalitarian gender theory or if he has a complementarian gender theory. Hmm. They look at the whys, right? Because the assumption is that these marriages are oppressive and, and, you know, they're, they're domineering patriarchs. That's right. And so the, the, they ask the wives, and the wives of complementary men report the highest level of happiness. Mm. And the wives of evangel uh, egalitarian men do not report higher level. You and I might expect that they would, but they did the studies, and they said egalitarian marriages are not any happier. Wow. And so, and he, you know what does make a difference? Whether the man puts his family first. That's right. Does he think the family is the most important part of his life? Mm. Men who have family-centric values Come on. <laughs> treat their wives and children well. That's so true. And then the other expert that I cite is a, not a Christian. His name is John Gottman, but he's considered the top marriage psychologist in the country. And he said, the, the couples who come into my practice, some of them believe the man should be in charge of the marriage, and some come in with much more egalitarian views. And he says, we don't see a difference. Hmm. And here's how he concluded. He said, emotionally intelligent husbands <laughs> <laughs> have figured out the most important thing, which is how to convey honor and respect to your wife. Wow. And so I quote those two experts and I say, therefore, I'm not dealing with these in-house debates among Christians. My interest is answering the charges from the secular world. Like, why does the secular world get their concept of masculinity so wrong? Yeah. So wrong that they actually think it's toxic. And so to answer that question, you have to go back to where, when did negative language about men start? Huh. Well, it actually started, like you said, with the Industrial Revolution. Because before that time, men worked alongside their wives and children all day on the family farm, the family industry, the family business. And so, the cultural expectation on men focus much more on their caretaking role, mm. their responsibility for the common good of the household. In fact, here's a um, fascinating historical fact. At that time, most literature to parents, you know, books and articles, sermons to parents, was addressed to fathers. Wow. You know, if you go into a typical store today, yeah. right, the books are all written to mothers. Yeah, and a lot of sermons are preached towards women and mothers today, yes. that's right. Yeah. Yes, but fathers were considered the primary parent, and so mm. the, all the literature addressed the father. Wow. And of course, fathers actually did spend as much time with their children as mothers did, which is hard for us to imagine today. But their sons especially were basically apprentices working alongside their fathers in their father's craft or business on the farm. Yeah. So the question, and I like reading even non-Christian historians because they will say things like, the definition, this is a direct quote from a secular historian. He says, the definition of masculine virtue was duty to God and man. Wow. <laughs> so then you say, whoa, where did we learn? Where did we lose that? Yes. The Industrial Revolution took work out of the home. And of course, men had to follow their work out of the home into factories and offices. And for the first time in American history, men were not working alongside their, their wives and children, people they loved, people mm. that they had a moral bond with. Instead, they were working as individuals in competition with other men. Mm. And you can imagine that the mentality does start to shift. And that's when you see the literature also start to change. People began to protest that men were losing the caretaking ethos. 
that wow. they'd had in the colonial era, that they were become, becoming competitive, egocentric, self-interested, greedy, acquisitive, look out for number one. Wow. I'm using the language of the day. Yeah. In fact, many people began to complain. Th this, this struck me as, um, as interesting, that they actually said men are starting to treat their career as their idol. Wow. Career success, financial achievement began to be treated as an idol. It was interesting how many critics used that phrase. Yeah. Um, so if you want to go back to where the negative language started, it's when men were disconnected from their families. We're so used to it today, we don't realize how shocking it was at the time. Mm. And so again, if you go back to the literature of the day, there's an incredible amount of books and articles and sermons decrying the fact that the, the family's been gutted. You yeah. know, the head of the home's not there anymore all day. Right. That, you know, it's been, the family's been hollowed out. Hmm. A magazine called Parents Magazine, 1842, had an article in which it said, the greatest cause of domestic sorrow in our day is paternal neglect. Wow. And it went on to say, uh, the father is toiling at his business early and late and has no time to fulfill his duties to his children. Hmm. So that's the kind of language that was used. Another article said, excuse me, this was a, a book at the time said, the, f the mainstay of the family, the head of the home, is hardly here from weekend to weekend. Hmm. And another was Frances Willard. She was the president of the Women's Christian Temperance Movement <laughs> Union, it was called, Women's Christian Temperance Union. She was, some historians say the most influential woman of the 19th century. Wow. And she wrote, the father is meant to be the prototype of the divine hmm. in the home because God is our father. That's right. And yet the prototype of the divine is not there from Sunday to Sunday. Wow. So it's good to remind ourselves that this actually was quite, it was quite traumatic at the time. Absolutely. In fact, many of, the, uh, many of the laws and policies that we think back to that got started back then, um, like reducing the, the work day, it was 12 hours, right? We reduced to 12 hours and then to 10, then to finally to eight. It was driven by people saying fathers need more time with their families. Wow. That's the main reason it was driven. Or even something like blue laws. We think that was religiously motivated, right? Yep. Close the shops on Sunday. No, it was, People like Frances Willard, um, her organization fought for the blue laws so that fathers could have at least one day with their family. Wow. <laughs> so a lot of those laws and, and policies were, were it, oh, the family wage is another one. How can we get, how can we pay men enough so that they can support their family without working such long hours away from their wife and kids? Yeah. So all that to say, uh, the history really helps us to get, get perspective on when did this happen? When did people start treating fatherhood? When did the language change and become negative towards in the characterization of the male character? Yeah, you, you had mentioned the, um, the father as the reflection of the divine. You know, the Puritans called that the moonish triplex, that Christ was the chief priest, prophet, and king. And then dad is the lowercase chief prophet and king of his home. He reflects that that to his home. The Puritans uh, who kind of coined that phrase, you know, dad as, as prophet priest of his home, they wouldn't even let you join the church if you weren't leading and discipling and providing and loving and shepherding your family well. And today it seems we've gotten just so far away from that, um, that, that this idea of um, the fatherly importance and the fatherly role, not just as a provider of financial means, but, but security, um, emotional support, physical support, psychological support, spiritual support is, is, is huge. I think about, I think the statistic is in 1960, 4% um, of children grew up in a fatherless home. Um, and today, uh, I think it's close to 40%. It's 40%. I mean, yeah. it's unbelievable. 40%. Yeah, it's the highest rate of single parenthood in the world. 
Wow. Isn't that amazing? America is at the top of something like that. That's a, we're, we're at the top of the rate of single parenthood in the world. Mm. So, so it is, and everyone knows that fatherless kids grow up at risk of more social pathologies, right? That yeah. they're more likely to have trouble at school, to drop out of school, to be addicted to drugs and alcohol, to have kids outside of marriage, to commit crime. Mm. I used to work for prison fellowship which is an international prison ministry. Oh, so yeah. we knew this firsthand wow. that the majority of young people who end up behind bars are fatherless boys. Yeah. And especially a violent crime. Mm. Violent criminals are almost all fa growing up in fatherless homes. Yeah. And, and um, what you mentioned earlier, um, unemployment. Male unemployment has also gone, gone way up in yeah. terms of, it's, it's not showing up in the unemployment statistics because they stopped looking for, for work. Mm -hmm. And so researchers had to dig deeper. And now they have found that male unemployment is at Great Depression era levels. Wow. I was shocked because yeah. we all remember what a crisis that was. Absolutely. But now male unemployment is at Great Depression era levels. Yeah. So boys growing up in fatherless homes, uh, the, the, the ripples go on and on for all the way into adulthood. You know, f fatherless boys do not function as well. Yep, and that, and that doesn't even include um, young men like me who grew up with a father present, but was emotionally, physically, spiritually, psychologically detached. I mean, I, I remember most of my childhood um, my dad spent, if my dad wasn't at work, he spent the majority of time in the garage. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 um, and might as well have not been there. Um, so, so I call that the functional orphan, right? That wasn't actually orphan, but, but functionally lives as an orphan um, from detached parents. And, and, and I just wonder how many men suffer from that today and the effects of that. Do you know what? Just as a historical point, that word was used in the 19th century. The leading psychologist of the 19th century. Wow. Um, when fathers were removed from the home because of the Industrial Revolution, he said, um, first of all, boys were growing up without their father's supervision, so they were rowdy and wild and undisciplined. Um, and he wrote, and he said, never before has the American boy been so wild and so half-orphaned. Wow. That was his word, half orphaned, because his father's out of the home and they're being raised by women in home, church, school. So he, the, the leading psychologist of the 19th century used that same word. They're half, he's a half orphan, orphan yeah. because the father's not in the home anymore. But I, I wanted to connect with you on uh, that, with my experience. I, I put it in the front of the book because I grew up in a very abusive home. Hmm. Uh, and by, by the way, the same thing though, my, my dad was a, a tinkerer, so even when he was home, hmm. he was always doing home improvement projects. Wow. So we, yeah, we just never interacted, except when he was angry and then he beat us. Oh, <laughs> but, um, You know, he, I, he would not say, do this, I'll spank you. He'd say, do this, I'll beat you. Wow. And then he would carry through on his threats. Hmm. So I put it right at the front of the book. Um, in, in a way to help Which, by the way, was very courageous. I just want to commend you on that. It was, it was very courageous. It's, um, yeah, you feel very vulnerable. <laughs> yes, yes, you have to, yes. Um, but, but I did want people to know, I, I'll, I'll put it in the words of one, one psychologist who interviewed me said, at least we know you're not writing from an ivory tower. Wow. <laughs> we know that you're writing from the trenches. And that's kind of the reason I put it there. I wanted people to realize I didn't grow up in a warm, loving, secure home. Mm -hmm. And I can, you know, so this is easy for me to say that men are one, that, you know, that Christian men are good. This was hard won. This is something that took a long time. A as you can imagine, when I grew up, I became a very strong feminist, mm -hmm. right? I, I read all the groundbreaking, the groundbreaking feminist books like Betty Friedan and Simone de Beauvoir, mm -hmm. Kate Millett, Susan Brown Miller, you know, all the foundational books for the feminist movement. And I thought they were wonderful. <laughs> and, and then eventually I became a Christian and, and that's when I started having to rethink this whole question. Wow. And yeah. so it's, it's been, it, uh, in, in a sense, at the, at the end of the introduction of the book, I say, in a sense, I've been writing this book my whole life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, yeah. And you do it with such, uh, you and I had chatted uh, before the interview, 
that that a lot of uh, s sensationalists today they want to they want to come at you with a lot of charisma. I think you use the word possess, but you write with such clarity. Um, it just it sh it it shadows a deep understanding of of what you're talking about and, and what you're writing about. And I love how you how you elevate clarity uh, above the charisma because because men need clarity today. I think churches need clarity today around what is true and what is good and what is right because of that secular script that really has infiltrated every aspect of life, including the church. Yeah, and we also talked about why, uh, why, why my book does not have a really polemical tone to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's the most fact-based book I've written. You know, it's yeah. really based on studies and data. And the most surprising of those facts is that evangelical men who attend church regularly, who are really committed, mm -hmm. test out as the most loving and engaged husbands and fathers. And the reason, I mean, I was as surprised as anyone to read this because the assumption is what we get from the media is that Christian men are exhibit A of toxic mm. masculinity. That's right. Um, I, I have, it was easy to find quotes, but I'll give you just one. <laughs> this was the co-founder of the Church Two movement, which mm. followed the Me Too movement. Right. And she said, um, the theology of male headship feeds the rape culture wow. that we see permeating American Christianity today. And so the thing is that Christian uh, psychologists and sociologists were listening to this and saying, well, where's your evidence? You know, you're making these accusations, but where's your data? Right. So they went out and did the studies. And in my book, I quote some dozen or so studies that all found that the, the media stereotypes are dead wrong. Right. Um, and that the, the um, Christian men, they, they do, they do uh, interview the wives as well. So their wives test out as saying they're the happiest with their husband's expressions of love and affection. Yeah. Christian men, evangelical men, test out as spending the most time with their children, 3.5 hours more per week than secular men. Wow. They have the lowest rate of divorce, 35% lower than secular couples, and actually they have the lowest rate of domestic abuse and violence of any major group in America. Yes. So this was shocking. I did not expect this. I was blown away by these statistics. That's what I decided to write the book, by the way. Right. Is when I read these, these statistics, these studies, I said, I've got to get this information out. Churches don't know this. That's like, right. They don't know that Christian men are doing so well. Let me give you a quote, because that sometimes can crystallize it. Hmm. So Brad Wilcox at the University of Virginia, to give you a sense of his stature, he writes for places like the New York Times. Hmm. Um, and so this is a quote from an article he wrote in the New York Times. He said, it turns out that the happiest of all wives in America are religious conservatives. Wow. And they're, they're focusing on the wives because the assumption is, is that these marriages are oppressive to the wives. Yeah, so. well, secular media hated that. They had to have hated that. <laughs> and it was in the New York Times, so right. <laughs> right in front of them. <laughs> right. The happiest of all wives in America are religious conservatives, fully 73% of women who hold conservative gender values and attend church re, uh, and who attend church regularly with their husbands have high quality marriages. Wow. And then, and actually, this is my favorite part of the quote. Then he turns to his secular colleagues and says, "Academics need to cast aside their prejudices against religious conservatives and evangelicals in particular. Mm. Evangelical Protestant." married men with children are consistently the most engaged and loving husbands and fathers. Wow. Direct quote. Yes. So that's what the data is showing. Yep. This is not a pep talk from some religious leader. That's right. You know, this is solid empirical evidence and we should be bold about bringing it into the public square. Absolutely. As well as bringing it into our churches to empower men in our churches. One of my graduate students was a, a head of a very large Baptist church here in in Houston. And she said, um, on Mother's Day, we honor the women and hand out roses. On Father's Day, we scold the men and tell them to do better. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so my book is Stop the Scolding. Yes. <laughs> you know, that's my message. No more scolding. How about encouraging and, and uh, supporting? Yes. 
Yeah, and, well, Men, men to that actually you're doing very well yeah we're not gonna we're not gonna shame and guilt men into God's design we're not gonna shame and guilt men back into the church you know one of the things I love about better man is we often say um, we're not winning men back to the church we're trying to win the church back to men oh, and yes. um, I was with uh, I was recently with a, a very prominent church leader in San Antonio and he asked me he said Chris what's one thing we could do today uh, to help recapture some of the uh, some of the loyalty towards men, and I told him the very same thing, uh, Miss Nancy. I said, "No more, no more dad jokes. No more embarrassing men. No more, no more shaming men." I said, "How about we start when we see a man leading his family, or or bringing his family to a church, or or doing what what God has called him to do? How about we just pull him aside and say, you know what? Well done. You know, great job. I see you. I want to encourage you." Uh, because so much of that secular script, like you say, um, you know, headship and and authority and and hierarchy um, isn't toxic. It's it's part of a design. It's only it's only toxic when it becomes manipulated, right? I think it was Dallas Willard who said God's chief aim is to look upon the earth and find men He can entrust with His power, because we're so privy to abuse the power, to neglect the power, and then and then it, it goes wheels off, but. But I just love your voice in that, that, hey, listen, the, the evidence is showing, you know, and, and I want our men to hear this. You said committed evangelicals. We're not talking about cultural Christians or nominal Christians, which we get a lot here in the South. And that's an important distinction because the first pushback I always get is, haven't we all heard that Christians divorce at the same rate as the rest of the culture? Yeah. In fact, when I post about this on Twitter, I always get that response, <laughs> even now. So what, the researchers went back to the data and they made that distinction that you just mentioned, which is crucial. They sorted out truly committed Christian men, evangelicals, um, from nominal Christian men, cultural men. By the way, my students don't know what the word nominal means, so I have to tell them N-O-M is Latin for name. So it means in name only. Wow, that's so good. <laughs> And the nominal Christian men. So these are men who might, on a survey like this, they might check the Baptist box, but they don't actually attend church, rarely, if at all. And they test out with all the toxic stereotypes. That's right. Their wives report the lowest level of happiness wow. with the way their husbands treat them. They spend the least amount of time with their kids. They divorce at a higher rate than even the secular culture, 20% higher wow. than the secular culture. Wow. And then the real shocker is they have the highest rate of domestic abuse and violence of mm. any group in America, even higher than secular men. Wow. So this is what the church is up against. You know, the statistics are going to be misleading if you don't make this distinction. That's right. right. How can the church encourage the men who are doing well, who are testing out as higher than secular men, and how do we reach out to these nominal men who are kind of at the fringes, who are claiming an evangelical identity, but who are actually wor doing worse than secular men, and wow. who, who probably are the main reason that evangelicals have a negative reputation. That's right. It's because many people are encountering these nominals. Some people have asked me, why would nominal men be even worse than secular men? Yeah. And apparently it's because a secular guy who's maybe hitting his wife and kids doesn't feel any l religious justification for it. Wow. But the nominal Christian man has heard enough, you know, he's hung around the fringes of the Christian world enough to pick up the language of headship and submission without getting the biblical meaning mm -hmm. of those terms. Like he's infused those terms with meaning from the secular script for masculinity wow. of control and dominance and entitlement. But then he justifies it with religious language. That's right. Like, you know, I'm the head, so I, have, I can do what I want hmm. with my wife and kids. Or she wouldn't submit, so I had to put her in her place. Wow. You know, so they end up testing out as worse than secular men. So that's tragic. And that's what we're up against when we, you know, our churches yeah. are trying to minister yeah. to Christian to men. Because the godly man who is following the Bible, when it says, um, everybody knows that first part, wives submit to your husbands, but it's that next part, um, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. He would never use a phrase like, um, she didn't submit, so I had to put her in her place. Because uh, it wouldn't even be in his vernacular, uh, because he's, he's laying down his life. And 
And so what I'm hearing, and I don't want to, I don't want to extrapolate too much on this, but but I'm hearing churches that that maybe push or promote a nominal or casual Christianity are actually, um, you know, exacerbating you know, exacerbating the problem. They're, they're, they 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 could be pushing this this toxic masculinity uh, either consciously or unconsciously with the promotion of of a casual or a nominal Christianity faith. That's a good point, and especially if the church itself has started to absorb. Uh, the secular script mm. and you're seeing that a little bit with the the influence of the manosphere yeah. right even christian even not just the young the young kids like i mentioned the high school kids being drawn into andrew tate but uh yeah. the, the the sort of a christian manosphere that is picking up the language from the secular script and bringing it into the church but again it's because christians have not use the language of the Bible. Here's what I go to again and again in the book. I think that one reason the church's message has been weak is that it has been somewhat limited. You know, the church operates with kind of a sacred secular split hmm. a lot of times, right? And so we, we draw men into the spiritual side. You know, being a Christian means reading the Bible and praying and going to church, and that's good. But, but what does it mean outside of just sort of the explicitly religious activities. Right. To get a fuller vision, you gotta go back to the cultural mandate, which is in Genesis. And again, half my students don't know what that means. <laughs> so, so it's in Genesis where you know, God has created the universe and the plants and the animals and creates the first human couple. What is the very first thing he says to them? Be fruitful and multiply, yeah. fill the earth and subdue the earth. And in the very streamlined language of Genesis 1, we can unpack several layers of meaning there. Um, be fruitful and multiply doesn't just mean have kids, you know, because historically, as any anthropologist will tell you, all culture flows out of the family. So the family becomes an extended family, a, clibe, a, a tribe, a clan, you know, a nation, wow. and, and, and also gives rise to social institutions for particular purposes, like you need a state, you need a church, you need a school, yeah. you need a marketplace. And so be fruitful and multiply really means create all of the social institutions that make a civilization work. Hmm. And subdue the earth means harness the natural resources. So again, it starts with agriculture usually, That's goes right. to mining and technology and goes to, in our own day, inventing computers right. and composing music. I had one student who said, oh, come on, composing music. So I said, I play the violin. I said, what's the violin made out of? Wood. That's right. <laughs> what's the bow made out of? Horse hair. Yeah. So all of the transcendent beauty that we associate with music starts with harnessing the raw materials of creation. Mm. So the, it's called the cultural mandate. This verse is called the cultural mandate because it means that God, God's original call to human beings was to create civilizations, to create cultures, yes. you know, to make history. Mm. And so that's a much richer vision of what we're calling men to. Well, women too, but since we're talking about men, you know, that gives them enough scope for a sense of accomplishment, achievement, mastery, impact. You know, that tells them that the work they, they do, you guys at Better Man, you focus on vocation. So there you go. You know, focusing on vocation gives men a sense that they've got a bigger calling than just going to church and praying once a week. Absolutely. Dorothy Sayers said, if, we don't, if the church does not speak to our work, then it's not speaking to what we do with nine-tenths of our time. That's right. <laughs> and no wonder people think the church is irrelevant. Yeah, well, back to one of your original points. God numerous times in scripture is is labeled and called a worker uh, he worked and and being made in his image we were made to work uh, we're, we're most like God I, I I have a strong conviction that that we're most like God when we're when we're working uh, when we're serving when we're giving you know I think about John three sixteen. everyone knows that verse you know, God so loved the world that he gave, and, and we can quote that. But if you just stop right there, <laughs> God so loved the world that he gave, like generosity is the heart of, of everything, the gospel and who God is that he gave. God's a giver. And when we're giving of our time and our talents and our treasure, of our love, of our service, you know, we're most like God. But to your point, that language seems lost today. 
Let, let me uh, piggyback on that with another study. This is a wonderful study. It's a global study again. Hmm. So it's a, even non-Christian cultures done by an anthropologist, David Gilmore, not a Christian. And he says, um, he did the first cross-cultural study of concepts of masculinity. Wow. And what he found is that in spite of differences between cultures, there is a common core of manhood, what it means to be a man across all cultures. And he, he, puts, he, he separates it into what he calls the three Ps, provide, protect, and procreate. Hmm. The last one meaning, you know, become a parent. That's right. Build into the next generation. And he said, this seems to be, again, a uniform, like we said with the other, the other global study that I cited earlier, it's global, it's inherent, it's innate. Men everywhere seem to understand that their unique strengths are not given them to dominate others and right. you know, make it for their own sake, but to love, help, protect, provide for others. And what he found, I didn't put this in the book, you know, for space you have to cut things. Right. But this is why I remembered it when you said giving. He found that every culture has an, uh, an ethic that the real man is generous. Wow. Every culture has a no notion that a real man makes enough not just to feed his own family. I mean, that, mm. You start with that, you know, right. provide and protect. You start with your own family, but the real man, <laughs> you know, the one who, um, the, 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 the the man who really lives out his, his full manhood is the one who creates enough that he can give to others. That's beautiful. Generosity is part of every culture's code of manhood. That's right. Innate, universal, one would say a part of a larger design, a <laughs> part of a larger design. Yeah, so, so back to, you know, and, and what I had told that prominent church was one of the things we have to stop doing is, is no more dad jokes, right? We've, we've won the children and we've won the women. We need to stop shaming the men with these frivolous jokes. And, and the whole dad joke movement has been a thing now for, for a few decades. And I personally think it's offensive and, and we shouldn't do it. Everyone knows that fathers are mocked and ridiculed in the media today, right? The, the Homer Simpson pattern. Yeah. Right. And, and actually, I even found elite culture saying things similarly. An article in the Atlantic Monthly saying, if fathers are not needed, hmm. you know. Or another article that said, you know, this, despite what we like to say about men, they have no objective contribution to make. Mm -hmm. So my question is, where did that start? We all know that's a problem, but where did it start? To solve a s social trend, you need to go back to where it started and how it that's developed. A, that's a good word. And once again, it started with the Industrial Revolution. Mm. Because when men were taken out of the home, for the first time, men got out of touch with their children. C you know, c compared to when they were spending all day together, they no longer was familiar with their kids' concerns and interests and needs. They were no longer as connected to the family dynamics. And already in the 19th century, you see st books and articles coming out uh, saying, well, men, Fathers are pretty much superfluous these days. Mm. Fathers have become irrelevant and incompetent. That's the key phrase. They were already being treated as incompetent fathers wow. because they were not close enough to their families to know what was going on and to, to be able to solve the problems that came up day to day in their, in their families. Mm -hmm. The Berenstein Bears, did you ever read them? I did, I, I, have, I read them to my kids today. <laughs> One of my sons loved them. You know, and the father always is the problem maker, not the problem solver. Wow. And yeah. so it does give us a sense then that what is the solution? Even in an industrial age, is there a way to flex the workplace to give fathers more time with their kids? Yeah. So I do have a whole chapter in the Toxic War on Masculinity uh, with solutions. And you know, the solutions are easier to sell today because of the pandemic. Because of that pandemic, a lot of fathers discovered they liked being home more and having closer relationship with their children. The Atlantic, uh, the magazine, s had an article where they said a lot of families rediscovered the pre-industrial <laughs> family life where they were working at home, educating the kids at home, even cooking at home. Can you believe that? That's right. <laughs> yeah. And rediscovering, in a sense, a kind of home-based uh, connection between work and family that we had before the Industrial Revolution. And Harvard, actually Harvard University, did a study 
this one's not in the book because it's more recent. Yeah. But Harvard did a study in which they found um, the conclusion was during the pandemic, fathers got closer to their children and they don't want to lose that. 68% wow. of fathers said they would prefer to have at least a hybrid situation after the crisis is over. They want some kind of flexible hours. In another study, 70% of fathers said if they had to choose flexible hours, even if it came at a reduction in salary, even if they paid the daddy penalty, 70% wow. <laughs> said they would rather have, they would choose family. Flex time and family time, they would choose over a higher salary. Wow. And by the way, a totally different um, study found the same number of women. I, th I thought that was rather coincidental. 70% of women said, they would rather have their husbands home, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, at least part-time, at least a hybrid situation, if it meant, even if it meant a lower salary. You know, yes, a lot of men in these studies say they realize they're not gonna move up the career ladder as quickly. That's right. They may take some hits in terms of salary, but in the surveys, they said it was worth it. It was worth it to have more time with their kids. Yeah, and that's, that's absolutely, um, beautiful and wonderful and so contrary to the script we hear today uh, to be your own man uh, to make a way uh, to climb the ladder and step on whoever you have to to get there that a lot of these other voices voices promote uh, there is this wonderful um, innate there's this sense of, hey, I've got this responsibility. I have this progeny. I want to be there with them and for them and to see them succeed. And again, more men need to hear that. In at least one study that I read about, 95% of fathers said they wish they had more time with their kids. Yeah. 95%. And it's even higher among young people. Millennials in surveys are more likely to say they really want to share caregiving and breadwinning. Yeah. You know, they want to be able to have a more integrated life. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the workplace is not set up for that. That's right. <laughs> so most millennials, you know, find that their ideals are somewhat shattered. Yeah. But in surveys, they, they say, we want to share. And by the way, I'm not above appealing to men's self-interest <laughs> because, because most, most of the time, uh, you know, be a better father comes across as kind of the scolding thing. Sure. So in my book, I talk about what men gain by becoming fathers. Wow. So, for example, one psychologist calls it the dad brain. There is a nest of neurons that don't get activated unless you become a father. Hmm. So that you literally experience brain growth when you become a father. Wow. Um, a, a nest of, it really, that's, that's how he puts it. It's, it's, it's Warren Farrell, who you may know because he's written some really good books on, uh, he wrote a book called The Boy Crisis. Yes. And so he writes also on the dad brain. Come on. <laughs> And, uh, and, and then they found a couple of uh, things. For example, uh, when, you, when, you, when your child is born, a man's testosterone goes down so that he's gentle and patient with children. It's, it's, high, it's high when he's pursuing a woman. Well, that's <laughs> but right. once he gets married and has kids, he, he's gen he gentles and his testosterone goes down um, and the oxytocin goes up. Oxytocin is the bonding hormone. Wow. And so it, it's what helps you connect with your child. Yeah. We've always known that a woman's oxytocin goes up during right. child, when she has a baby, but th until recently they didn't know a man's oxytocin goes up too. It turns out it's triggered by a tactile sense. So he has to be actually holding and cuddling and playing with his baby for it to be triggered. And when he does that, the baby's oxytocin goes up too. That's amazing. And so a chemical symbiosis is created a neurological connection is created between the father and his child. Yes. And then the final thing, this is the most recent discovery, um, as, and it's by an anthropologist. She, she reports it in a book called The Life of Dad. They discovered that a man's oxytocin is rising all through the nine months of his wife's pregnancy. Wow. So that all through the nine months, God is preparing the man biochemically Hmm. neurologically to be a full member of the parenting team to be just as committed to parenting as his wife is um by the way i guess nobody 
nobody ever thought of testing a man's blood during his life pregnancy before. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but when they did, yeah. they found out, you see, the, the assumption of the social scientists has been that motherhood is natural, fatherhood is a cultural invention. Wow. You know, anthropologist Margaret Mead, who's very famous, yes. said that. You know, motherhood is natural, fatherhood is a social convention, or invention is the word she used. Well, that makes men feel like, well, it's not intrinsic to my nature then. That's right. You tell people, that, you tell men often enough that fatherhood is not intrinsic to your nature, and they will, they will not be motivated to become fathers. Wow. That's so right. I think that's why this is so important. No, God has actually biochemically primed men for fatherhood. Yes. And they find their truest fulfillment when they do live out fatherhood. And I get questions from single men, so I add this. You can experience a, f a kind of spiritual fatherhood, too, That's as a right. single man, by becoming a mentor That's it. to young men, yeah. by working through your church uh, as a youth group leader, by working with big brother organizations. Yeah. And there's plenty of young men out there that are needing that there's because so of the lack of biological and spiritual fathers. It's, it's an epidemic. So we really need men who are willing to step in and be substitute fathers. And there was, uh, l let me give one, one more study. I love this st these studies because, you know, they give you something to sink your teeth in. These it's are so actual, good. These yes. are facts. Yeah. There was a study done on how, um, how fathers, trans well, it was on how parents transmit their faith to the next generation. It's called, I think the title of it is Families and Faith. But it was an award-winning study because it was 35 years longitudinal study, so wow. huge study. And they found two surprising things. One is fathers matter more than mothers for, for passing on their faith. Yeah. You know, if the father's a committed Christian, his children are more likely to, father, to, to follow him. If the mother's a Christian, yes, she still has an influence, but the father has a greater influence. The second thing they found that it only works if the father has a close, warm, loving relationship with the child. Wow. If the father is a pillar of the church, a moral exemplar, has perfect theology, <laughs> but the kids perceive him to be cold, distant, authoritarian, they won't follow him. Hmm. They won't follow him into the faith. So it's the nature of the relationship that counts. Fathers count more, but they have to have a loving relationship with their kids. Oh, Professor Pearson, when you say that, um, I'm reminded of, Exodus 20, you know, God gives his children Israel the Ten Commandments, but right before he does it, and most people don't catch this, he reminds them of how much he loves them. He says, I'm the God that provided for you, that brought you out of Egypt. And then out of the he land gives, of slavery. That's it. And then he gives them the rules, right? The relationship always precedes the rules. So many men need to hear that today. I love that. I, I, that's been very personally meaningful to me. Mm. You know, uh, you know with, with coming out of an abusive home. Yes. You know, God, when God says, I brought, you, I, I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, that has always been very meaningful to me mm. because of my background. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let me, one, one more study. Even secular people are finding how important the father's relationship is. There was a study done on how to produce masculine sons. Wow. <laughs> this is interesting. Um, and the study found the same thing. That it does not matter how masculine the father is. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. You don't have to be a macho male. <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, you don't have to feel pressure to fulfill these cultural stereotypes. That's right. Again, they found that it's the quality of the relationship that counts. Mm -hmm. If the father has a warm, loving, supportive relationship with the child, this, with his son, then his son will have a secure sense of masculinity. Wow, and that's something, um, something that irritates me is how churches sometimes fall into these stereotypes of men. So every church event has to be throwing an ax or every church event has to be, you know, some wild game feed where someone hunted something and then they ate it. But that's, that's not all men, you know, and sometimes the church can even feed into these stereotypes of, of, of what a man is when the reality is no, men can be singers and dancers and painters and electricians and plumbers and all these things. The, um, the expressions of masculinity can change, but it's the principles of masculinity that don't change. Those are timeless, you know, because they're rooted, um, as you talk about, they're rooted in God's design, that innate design, His Word, which is a beautiful thing. 
Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I, I talk to some of the young men here on campus, and they say the worst stereotypes are in the church. Mm. Mm. You know, some of the men here, uh, some of the men here who, young men, who are, like you said, either more artistically oriented or, oh, they're, they're, they're um, majoring in psychology. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because they like talking about emotions and relationships. That's right. The things that we usually think, you know, girls are interested in. Well, there, there are boys who are interested in those things. And, uh, and they have actually told me the stereotypes are worse in, the chur in Christian circles. That's right. Uh, it's, har it's very hard. But th this ties in actually to my earlier book, Love Thy Body, um, because I deal with transgenderism there. Yeah. And I tell the story of a young boy who had gender dysphoria because he was a very gentle, sensitive, sweet, relational, emotional mm. boy. <laughs> <laughs> and he struggled. He struggled terribly with that because... And he's one of the first to tell me. He's, he was the first person to alert me to this problem. And he said, the churches, the churches are where I have the hardest time because the stereotypes are so rigid. Um, it's almost as if the church is trying so hard to stand against the culture mm. that the feminine stereotypes are rigid as well, right? And the masculine yeah. stereotypes are rigid. So I think it is important for Christians to look at... Scripture, most commands in Scripture are to both men and to women. That's right. You know, the, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, yeah. you know, the, the Sermon on the Mount. That's right. Uh, are all to men and women. You know, there's, there's not a little blue box saying, you know, he, th these, these gifts of the Spirit are for men. That's right. <laughs> and these gifts of the Spirit are for women. This fruit over here is for women. <laughs> this fruit over here is for men, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's very, uh, uh, prophecy and teaching are not masculine. Right. which is what we would think. Mercy and service are not feminine. Come on. Which is what That's we would such think. such a good word. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and so we, we really do need to make sure that we're covering, like you said, the whole range of human personality. Yeah. But, yeah. And, you know, people say, well, when I was writing the book, of course, the, the, after I said that, the first question was, well, what are the differences then? And so I say, well, just let's go back to biology. That's right. <laughs> you know, the most obvious differences are biological. That's right. That men are bigger, stronger, faster, 75% greater upper body muscle mass, 90% mm -hmm. greater upper body strength. Wow. And because of testosterone, in general, they are more aggressive and risk-taking. And it is, it is very important to say these are good qualities. These, these are the creational givens. You know, that's right. Coming out of a, an abusive home, I couldn't say that was good. That's right. A couple, a couple years ago, I couldn't. I didn't. I did not see those as good traits. I had to train myself in a biblical worldview. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and say, okay, what the way God has created men is good. That's right. Um, and but the the other side of it is, um, I was on a podcast not long ago with a young woman, and she said. How can men encourage women to be feminine, to be soft and sweet and feminine? <laughs> and I said, well, they need to respect them when they are. There you go. That's right. <laughs> because a lot of men, you know, if they, if, in another man, if a man was gentle, emotional, relational, they would re interpret that as weakness. That's right. They would say, oh, I can walk all over this guy. So they often don't make a mental shift. They often do treat women as if that those are weaknesses. That's right. And they don't respect women for being gentle, sensitive, relational. That's right. And uh, and women pick that up. Why do you think? Uh, was it you earlier? I think it was be before we started, and you said our, our culture tells men to be more feminine, d men to be more like women, mm -hmm. but it tells women to be more mm -hmm. like men. <laughs> that's right. But that's because women sense that feminine qualities are not respected. That's right. And even childbearing. I mean, the biggest biological difference, of course, is childbearing. That's it. And childbearing means that through much of their adult life, certainly before the Industrial Revolution, through millennia of human history, right, women spent a good bit of their adult life being pregnant, nursing, carrying babes in arms. That's right. And usually all three at once. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Which takes a lot of strength, by the way. It takes a lot of strength. That's right. Uh, you know, an infant, an infant, when, he's in, when an infant's in distress, you meet their need immediately. You don't reason them with them. Yeah. <laughs> you don't scold them. <laughs> you, you don't punish them. You, no matter what you're doing, you have to stop 
and, and meet their distress. That's right. So it, it, it creates incredible powers of sensitivity, willingness to- Intuition. Intuition, mm -hmm. ability to understand nonverbal communication. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> um, did I say patience already? <laughs> <laughs> and we need to treat these as strengths. That's it. And of course, mama, they become mama bears too. They become sensitive to threats to the baby and the environment. That's right. So it's, it's very important that we treat women's strengths as strengths and respect them for that. Mm. You know, you can't counter the feminist movement, you know, insofar as it's, like you said, insofar as it has tended to, ele it has tended to elevate male, male characteristics, characteristics and say women should have those. Yeah. Um, but they tend to sort of overlook that feminine strengths need to be respected as strengths as well. Absolutely, that's so good. Professor Piercy, we have a, um, we have a lot of churches, church leaders, um, men who lead other men that, that watch our show and tune into the podcast and things of that nature. What would you, what would be a, an encouragement to them? Or, or if you had a, a final word or a parting word to them, what would you tell them today that they're, that, that are listening and watching? Well, like I said, I wrote the book when I ran into these studies because I said the church needs to get this data out there. Yeah. Men need to be encouraged. And by the way, uh, there were two kinds of studies. Um, one of the kinds of studies was just surveys hmm. of Christian couples. And I have been asked sometimes <laughs> by uh, by people who are somewhat critical of the book, well, why didn't you talk to the theologians? If you wanted to know what headship means, <laughs> why didn't you talk to the, you know, the experts? And I thought, it, because I was answering the charges from the secular world. The secular world says any belief in male headship in the home will turn men into overbearing, tyrannical patriarchs. Yeah. That's an empirical claim. Right. So it needs an empirical answer. Hmm. Namely, does it? Yeah. <laughs> does it turn men into these overbearing uh, patriarchs, you know, who don't respect or love their wives? And so I went to the surveys of actual Christian men and women. Wow. And I was blown away. 